one can do so, but uh, and uh, well, MPI is thread safe. The transport protocols work all right, but uh, then you have the added difficulty of synchronizing data within parallel regions. So when when is that valid? When is that happening? And to make sure you have additional synchronization, so threads don't step uh, upon each other. There's a lot of information here. Mm -hmm. How long does it take before you become fluent in interpreting these sort of diagrams? Well, I would say uh, the learning curve to a basic program is, a, is an hour or three. Yes. Uh, we are here looking to a really advanced example, like how long does it, does it uh, take until you will be able to combine OpenMP and, and MPI programming fluently. That would, would, uh, would have the nice effect of you have a concept of what you are doing. And if you have a concept of what your program does, or should do, and how OpenMP and MPI interact, it's, it's much easier to look at that. So... It's a bit hard for us, but... Okay. Um, yeah, I, I did choose that on purpose to have the really far end here, like, before we had embedded, and I thought, ah, <laughs> let's go for the formula one. Uh, le learning from your comment, I... I after this, I show a really, really simple program flow. <laughs> Same tool, but a more simple program, and you probably understand what's happening there, okay. right, right away. The fact you can see that the information is here, there's yep. a lot of information, but it doesn't seem to acquire quite a bit of understanding of what might be going on. Well, uh, the thing would be, you look at uh, where is computation and where is non-computation and uh, figure out if the non-computational part is particularly out of balance, mm -hmm. so has, has wiggly, wiggly lines connected to it, um, and then understand which part of the program is that. And, uh, so you get to the stage where you look at these diagrams and the diagram looks nice and things are probably going okay, or the diagram looks nasty and mm -hmm. things might be going wrong. Do you, you get that sort of intuitive feel for these? these visualizations? Um, ye, well, there is help to that intuition. So mm -hmm. there's, there's graphs that, that help you uh, displaying here is more usage of MPI or a particular function than at other places. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, I can bring that up as an additional chart here. Like it would, it would sort colors over time, and now if you, if you know red or remember red is the 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 MPI usage, you would just go through the time of that program and figure out oh where is MPI used a lot or with the green part where is OpenMP synchronization happening a lot, so that's parts of the program <clears throat> where you want to understand uh, how things work and if you can make changes to improve that and make that shorter. So if the, the logics of messages and waiting tell you, well, that could be done differently, uh, then you can improve it by that time. Obviously, anything in between, um, like the matrix multiplication or so, that's, uh, that's not part of OpenMP overhead <coughs> or MPI overhead at all. It also tells you this, this, uh, is uh, a different opportunity maybe for optimization, but you want to look at that with a different tool. So we, we had a discussion you know, yesterday with, with Chris, Christoph brought that up. The regular workflow of looking at <coughs> performance on applications and clusters is uh, not just firing this up and look at the colorful pictures. But it is run that program and use something uh, like the functional statistics to figure out what's the three biggest uh, functions that that use most of the time, and then look at that first and try to optimize the sequential version of that as much as you can using MKL using AVX instructions, whatever, 
maybe even diving into those instructional details with a video and amplifier and understand where instructions or memory accesses are stored. So optimize sequential first, look at the three biggest uh, time consuming functions and mark those in such a parallel program flow. And look at the MPI and OpenMP flow then with the timeline or with t this tool and figure out, okay, now that everything that computes <coughs> we think runs as fast as possible, like matrix multiplication, where is it stuck then? And uh, then, then go into that. So optimizing all parameters at the same time is not that clever. One change at a time and use scalar optimization first or a single node optimization first, then look at parallel runs. Uh, just one more, more chart here and then I turn to something distributed but simple. <coughs> so here would be a profile of the data that is that is communicated between the threads. Hello. So this is looking like a chessboard, and what it's actually doing is it's having process and thread numbers, and would tell you this thread sends to this thread. And uh, looking at those patterns, you would understand what the network does, or even further, what the application does. <coughs> if you look at it at first, it's just very colorful. Uh, if you look at it more closely, this would be like neighboring MPI processes sent to each other. Zero sends to one, one sends to zero, so they exchange data. That is due to, well, the whole data set in this distributed application is <coughs> split into domains and you would have from time step to time step or from iteration to iteration look at neighboring data. So all that diagonal is a single dimension and as the, the uh, GeoFAM code allows to uh, do two or three dimensional uh, uh, data decomposition and simulation. This is the 2D mode where in addition to like neighbors in that direction, you have neighbors in another direction. And they show on uh, like a, a similar <coughs> diagonal uh, way. Okay, so this was meant to show you uh, how to work with hybrid codes how uh, commercial codes that simulate cars, weather, earthquakes, all that would be developed with these tools and optimized. And now we look at something that is much, much simpler. This is a core array Fortran program running on a cluster with eight images. So, as before, every line is a core or a process, so a program running. Lines in between are communication. The blue one would be application computation, and the red one would be network usage or MPI in this case. <coughs> so while the application splits a whole range of numbers into compute prime numbers from 0 to 1000, 1000 to 2000, 2000 to 3000, uh, you see uh, prime number computation on lower numbers works faster as bigger the numbers become. <coughs> computation takes longer. So the, the search for if this is a prime and the computation of 
like factorization takes longer. So they, they all have the same number of computations inside. And all that program does in the end is collect the result and print it. And that would be uh, the synchronization that, that goes out here and the last line here. And we zoom into that and, and uh, look at the, at the names of MPI routines that we'll be using. So MPI barrier is just let's get in sync with everybody so everybody knows we are finished with computation and looking to the last bit of the program. Here is like every every computational node has a result and transports it to the master node, which then prints the result and deallocates all memory and goes to the MPI finalize. So <coughs> That program would would correspond to the source code that looks like. So this. So a single statement in Core Array Fortran would do assignments from all the images one by one. To, some, to, to communicate the count that was computed into a single value and then it is printed. So it doesn't always need to be that complicated. And I, I hope that that was a good example to make, make it understand without going to the max of what, what complexity allows. <coughs> right. Um, so this is, this is pretty much it. We had James this morning saying, parallelism is out there. Um, it's there in many ways. It's there in multiple functional units, multiple cores, multiple sockets, multiple nodes. Uh, <coughs> you have a choice of uh, language or library to uh, most effectively convert your program, uh, your problem into a, a, a program. And with that, use debugging, use performance analysis, and use all the, the libraries and, and tools available around that. And the Cluster Studio 2011 has everything in place to do that in C or Fortran with shared memory or distributed memory, and yeah, even compose hybrid applications on that. So, parallelism out there. We should be ready with that. Um, questions? This, this yeah. multi-interconnect uh, support you mentioned, uh, yes. is it dynamically with the same binary or you have to link against different libraries? It's dynamically with the same binary. And it's that not allow, only allows you to go from one cluster to, to another which has a different network, yes. even if you have the same cluster and swap network cards or have newer device drivers for the network cards, which regularly happens, same binary will continue to run. Is um, CoA, or is, is the Intel Fortran mm -hmm. a standard Fortran, or is it the extensions to standard Fortran? Uh, it's a standard Fortran and core array that is part of the Fortran 2008 standard. Okay. So Fortran through its years goes through different levels of standardization yeah. and, and features with that. But the, and the Core Array was recently added. Okay. Because the, what I remember about Fortran's success was that it really was a standard language um, in a way that some of the things that came along to replace it had um, IO extension stuff like that, which were proprietary. Um, Fortran really will succeed by being a standard, not anywhere. Yeah, so, so that, that happened. Mm -hmm. And even even though, I mean, we, we had this more, James mentioned there's a couple of T3E or T3 Cray Fortran, Core Array Fortran programs around. Uh, I've, I've experienced that. Partially, they, they follow the standard, yes, but there has been also like use of very intrinsic private functions on the Cray machine, mm. which then doesn't translate so well. Uh, 
I think it's good that it eventually made it into the Fortran standard. Mm -hmm. So you can now say the compiler and the program complies to the standard or not. Mm -hmm. And the inter uh, uh, Fortran compiler just does implement what the standard today writes. Mm -hmm. So that's not a private extension. There's a question. Uh, under Windows HPC Server 2008 R2, uh, mm -hmm. there is typically you have the job manager and this, this class run and all this, these tools. Uh, and can the Intel, com the Intel uh, tool chain coexist with the Microsoft uh, tool chain? Or if you go then there will be uh, MPI exec or things that will be uh, different? No, it can coexist. It doesn't really integrate into that visual environment. Yes. So be prepared to that. Yeah. Um, but it, it installs in parallel to that, yeah. and it, it would coexist, and you just invoke it then by using that MPI exec. So, suppose MPI exec can run on the same system, but on different, different uh, uh, Well, MPI exec then requires demons to be started, yes, yes, and yes. requires that you have a host name list and yes, all of that. Yes, yes, yes. But given that, yes, you can start that. Yes. To check it. I also should mention that the whole cluster studio does work for Linux the very same way as for Windows, with one exception, Core Ray Fortran today is not ready on Windows, it will follow later in the year. Uh, so if you were very interested in using that, you need to start on Linux, but everything else is there, and by the way, it works the same on Intel as on non-genuine Intel. So the MPI library, there's no big difference. Uh, it executes the very same paths and instructions and there with, you go. With processor pinning? Hmm? With the processor pinning? Uh, processor pinning? With AMD, which is not working with the... Oh. I... I haven't tried. Oh, yeah. We have to look into that. Yes? Uh, so uh, it was about uh, processor pinning actually because uh -huh. uh, when you use the hybrid approach, uh, how do you deal with the thread pinning? Pin? Are they just ideally you, should, you would need them on the, with the same uh, task or with the task zero with the MPI process? Um, we can look into the variables you have to set to make that happen, and then there is like you need to decide <laughs> decide if you. Uh, oversubscribe or not? Yeah, but without without oversubscription. But without oversubscription, it should be pretty straightforward. Um, I we, we can email yeah. and point to the where the manual line says this is the parameter and how to set it. Good. So thank you for your patience on that far end of computing. And uh, I think this, this concludes the, the session part of the day. And please, if you have uh, the surveys, you can fill them out. If you don't have anyone, uh, any sheet, you can, you can give you one. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can just leave them on your table. I think we something very important um, they told me that I should tell you that we are leaving between 15 minutes past 6 and half past 6. So a little bit later because the others have been working. So you have uh, 20 minutes to 30 minutes until we walk the rest home. Okay. Good. Anna. Let's talk. Let's talk.